Thank you, Jesus. The angel said to the other angel, he is holy. I wonder if as we make our way to our seats, if you could just find somebody, tell him he's holy. He's holy. That's it. That's it. Tell him. Don't stop praising him. Just tell him he's holy. He's holy. Blessed be his holy name. Hallelujah. 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 We thank God for what he's doing in this house. We thank God for what he's doing in this house. Hallelujah. The Lord is in this temple. The Lord is in this temple. Bless his holy name. I wonder if we could put our hands together and clap unto the Lord God. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. I thank God for what we feel here tonight, what we felt last night, what we felt today. The Lord is doing something beautiful in this convention, and it's an honor to be a part of it. I'm so thankful to be at Indiana Holiday Youth Convention. And this, of course, brings back many wonderful memories for me, and I am grateful to be here between Christmas and New Year's. It's an Indiana tradition, and, and it's been one that's taken place for many years, and so many people have been touched and changed by these moments, these experiences in the presence of the Lord. And this year will be no different. You're going to take home something with you that will change your life forever. How many can testify to the fact that God has already begun to do a work in you that will change your life forever? When I think back uh, on the many wonderful memories that I have being at the Indiana Youth Convention, amen, Brother Phil and Sister Annette Jordan were our district youth presidents. We had wonderful time on the youth committee, amen. Those were good days. And it's, it's an amazing thing to watch a new generation go forward and 140 plus real McCoys. What an absolute history making powerful miracle that is amazing and I honor you Indiana for for that great milestone achievement and uh, we thank God for it many lives will be changed only eternity will tell the story of what all was achieved by these real McCoys doing what the Lord called them to do amen I'm going to invite your attention to the gospel according to Matthew and also to the book of Acts and I want to say Thank you to Brother Peterson and Sister Peterson and Brother and Sister Gilliland and this great youth committee. Can we give this great youth committee a great big hand? Brother Martin, God bless this great youth team. Love and honor them. Greatly appreciate them and the work that they are doing. And Brother DJ Hill, what a word today. My goodness, how many, how many are thankful we heard the gospel today? Hallelujah. I think that word silences the lies of the enemy, removes the fig leaves of falseness, and removes the labels that the accuser tries to put upon us. And I thank you, Brother Hill. It's been a great pleasure to be with you and to, to partner with you in this great convention. I'm looking to the word of the Lord, and I'll invite your attention to the math, gospel according to Matthew chapter 16, also to the book of Acts chapter 2. We'll begin reading at the 13th verse of Matthew chapter 16, the scripture says this, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. From the book of Acts, the second chapter, and I want to read beginning at the 36th verse. Therefore, 
Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call I want to speak to you tonight on this subject the keys to the kingdom the keys to the kingdom. Can we lift up our voices all across this house one more time and ask the blessing of the Lord upon this service and upon the preaching of his word. God, I thank you for this gathering of your people, the gathering of the faithful. I thank you for your spirit that has so generously and graciously moved among us. And I pray that your word would have free course. Send forth your word to heal, to set us free, to enlighten us. God, I pray that you will allow each and every one of us to step into the promise of your kingdom. Help us, I pray, to receive your word, to live according to it. We give you the praise, O oh God. We give you the honor and the glory, for there truly is none like unto you. Hallelujah, we give you praise. Hallelujah, we honor your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. And amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. King Nebuchadnezzar was a king of ancient times, and he was perhaps most notable for his role in the taking captive of the Hebrew people, his role in the captivity of the people of Israel was something that came upon them because of the fact that they had sin among them. And that sin was something that they were unrepentant of and God gave them chance after chance to turn away from it. And they just simply would not, they simply did not. And Nebuchadnezzar was the, was the king that came in as a punishment and as a judgment of their wickedness. But Nebuchadnezzar was what we would call an emperor. He reigned over the empire of Babylon, and that was basically a region that covered the then known world. He was without question, as men go, the most powerful man in the world, as the world's measurement of great men would, would have it. And he thought of himself that way. And he considered himself to be an emperor and to be godlike. People thought of him as being somewhat divine, and he kind of imagined himself to be that way. He had a very highly exalted view of himself and wanted others to have that same view. And so the scripture records this moment where that Nebuchadnezzar awakened in the night with a dream that left him feeling eerie. He felt troubled and disturbed. It was an eerie feeling that he could not shake. He tried to overcome this feeling, but it, it just simply haunted him and would not let him go. Nebuchadnezzar tried to consider what it was that was making him feel that way, but the trouble he was having was that, was that this, this dream was something that left him disturbed, but, but he didn't remember what he had dreamed. And, and so he could only lay, lay a, a finger upon what he was feeling and not why he was feeling it. He called for the magicians. He called for the soothsayers. He called for the fortune tellers and asked them to please help him. In the middle of the night, he awakened them, called them from their chambers, brought them to his court, and began to inquire of them, why am I feeling this way? And he, he began to explain to them that he had need of the interpretation of a dream. And as he began to explain to them that 
this need for the interpretation, they readied themselves. They prepared to begin to speak to him. And they said, well, we're happy to help you, king. We just need you to tell us what was the dream about. King Nebuchadnezzar said, therein lies the problem. I don't remember what I dreamed. I need you not only to tell me the interpretation of the dream, I need you to tell me what the dream was to begin with. And this was the moment that these magicians and wise men and soothsayers and astrologers were all found to be frauds, the frauds that they had always been. Because they were waiting for him to give them the details of the dream. And then they would make up what the comparisons were and what the metaphors meant and what the allegory was. Just, just give us the details and we'll say something that soothes you, hence the term soothsayer. But, but as he began to call for them to do more than put on a show, he said, I need you to tell me what the dream was. They were empty-handed. They were liars, they had always been liars, and now it was known. Nebuchadnezzar was sorely displeased that they were incapable of giving to him the dream and then the interpretation of the dream, and he ordered their execution. He said, I want all of their heads. I want them to be killed. I want them to be killed on the spot. Not just them, but every wise man in the land. I want them to be hauled out of their houses, and I want them to be killed. And while they were gathering the wise men, this would include, again, the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers, but it would also include real prophets. And one of the prophets that they, that they awakened and pulled out of his chamber was a man by the name of Daniel. And Daniel was a man in whom was an excellent spirit, and it was the spirit of God that moved upon him. And when they talked to Daniel, they notified him that a decree had gone forth and that he was going to have to die along with the rest of the wise men. To this, Daniel said, why do I have to die? And they said, because nobody can give the king what he wants in the way of information. They don't know what he dreamed. He said, I'll tell you what he dreamed. You just take me into the courtroom of the king and I'll be happy to tell you what he dreamed. I'm not afraid of this. I have the real thing. I'm not one of these heretics. I'm not one of these false prophets. I'm not, I'm not one of these people who pretend to be something that I'm not. I have the real thing. So you take me before the king. And when they took Daniel before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar had, had murder in his mind. He had blood in his eyes. And he looked at Daniel and said, now I'm going to give you a chance. Daniel said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to tell you what you dreamed, but before I do, I need you to know that it is not by my power and it is not by my wisdom, it is not by anything that I have manufactured or have conjured, I'm going to speak to you under the unction of the Spirit of Almighty God, the God of Israel. And he said, the visions of your head upon your bed are these. You saw a great image. This image had a golden head. It had silver shoulders. It had a belly as brass. It had, it had uh, legs of iron, and it had feet of iron and clay. And as he's talking, Nebuchadnezzar is being reminded, and his memory is being refreshed, and his brain is being taken back to the thoughts upon his bed, and he, he, he begins to respond, yes, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's it, that's right. That's it. Yeah, yeah, it was a big image, and the head was golden, and the, the feet were uh, uh, iron and clay. Yeah, this, you're exactly right. And, and Daniel said, and, and this, was your, this was your vision. And you watched this statue until there was a, a, a rock that was actually hewn out of a mountain without hands. And this rock came toward this image, and it struck the image at the feet and it destroyed the image. The image came crashing down. And the rock replaced the image. It replaced the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, the iron and the clay. And the rock stood in the place of where the image had stood and it grew. It grew and it grew and it grew until it became a mighty mountain and it filled all of the earth. 
And Nebuchadnezzar's mind was blown. He said, how in the world did you know what I dreamed? I couldn't even remember it, and that's exactly the dream that I had. Daniel said, now I'm going to give you the interpretation. Here's the interpretation. That image were, was an image of kingdoms and subsequent kingdoms. That golden head, King Nebuchadnezzar, was your kingdom of Babylon. It will be replaced by another kingdom, which is the silver shoulders. And it's the, it's the kingdom of the Medo-Persian Empire. And that kingdom will be replaced by another kingdom that repre is represented by the belly of brass which will be replaced by another kingdom which is represented by the legs of iron. And that kingdom will be ultimately replaced by a kingdom that is reflected by the feet of iron and clay. And then that rock that was hewn out of the mountain without hands, that rock represents the kingdom of the God who gave me the unction to tell you what you dreamt. His kingdom is going to strike every one of these kingdoms and remove them from the face of the earth. And his kingdom is going to replace them. And it's going to stand where they stood, but it won't just stay stagnant. It's going to grow and multiply and expand until his kingdom fills the whole earth. And that is your dream and the interpretation of your dream. And to that, Nebuchadnezzar began to worship the God of the people of Israel. But it was short-lived. It wasn't long after he had been, been in this experience with Daniel, just a few verses later that he began to think about it, and he didn't like this idea of, of this kingdom replacing his kingdom. Whose kingdom is going to replace my kingdom? What kingdom is going to replace me? And, and he didn't like the idea, so he built a statue and this statue didn't just have a golden head. It was golden from head to foot. And, and he demanded that everyone worship this statue. And it was kind of his way of saying, I'll show you what kingdom will fill the whole earth. It's going to be my kingdom. And it was a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And it was in response to this dream and the interpretation of the dream. And he commanded all people in the kingdom to worship this image when the music played. And when the music began to play, everybody worshipped except three young men whose names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah but had been changed by Nebuchadnezzar to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they heard the music and when they heard the decree that they were to worship this image, they said, we will not bow to that image. He said, you will bow or I will throw you into the fiery furnace. They said, you can throw us into the fiery furnace. We're still not going to bow to that image. He said, I will heat the furnace up seven times hotter than what it is right now. They said, you can, you can heat it up as hot as you want to heat it up. We will never bow to that image. They said, our God is able to deliver us. That's faith in the power of God. Then they said, if God chooses not to deliver us, that's his prerogative. We're still not going to bow. That's faith in the wisdom of God. We have faith in the power of God, and we have faith in the wisdom of God. But regardless of whether it's his power or it's his wisdom, we will not bow to the kingdoms of this world. Every kingdom of this world is going to be wiped away, washed away, removed away and there's only going to be one kingdom there is no king but the Lord Jesus Christ there is no God but the Lord Jesus Christ and he is not multiple persons and he is not multiple personalities and he is not multiple personas and he is not multiple entities and he is not multiple beings here Oh, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and him only shall you worship. Only 
Only he is going to get our praise. Only he is going to receive our reverence. And it doesn't matter who commands us to bow to the kingdoms of this world. We will not bow. And it doesn't matter what music they play. And it doesn't matter whether we like the beat of that music. We will not bow to the kingdoms of this world. He alone is worthy. He alone is holy. He, oh, hallelujah. I feel like I've got some Hebrew children in the house. I feel like there's some young people who have made up in their mind, I will never bow. You better decide it right now because there's going to come a day when the pressure gets real. There's going to come a day when everybody around you, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. God forbid, but there might even come a day when the person next to you right now would bow. But you better never bow. I don't care if everybody in this room bows. You don't bow. You can take this whole world, but give me Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I said I have decided. I made up in my mind to follow Jesus. All kingdoms will fall. Every kingdom will fall. Only his kingdom will stand. Every political ideology will fall. Every worldly philosophy will fall. Every part of the entertainment industry will be dismantled. Every part of the sports industry will be completely done away with. Everything that can be shaken shall be shaken. This whole world as you know it, all of the financial markets will collapse. We do not get unnerved. We do not get scared when things start getting a little shaky. We expect them to get a little bit shaky. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We're not afraid of the Antichrist. We're not afraid of the mark of the beast. We're not afraid of nuclear war. We're not afraid of COVID. We're not afraid of cancer. We're not afraid of totalitarianism. We worship one God, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> we are the generation upon whom the ends of the world are come. Yes, we are. And we're not afraid of the kingdoms of this world. They're coming down. Every one of them are coming down. So don't get wrapped up in them. Don't get intertwined with them. Don't get emotionally invested in them. Don't let them distract you. Don't let them pull you off the path. They are coming down. All of them. The devil took Jesus into this temptation experience and, and began to point to the kingdoms of the earth. And he said to him, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said, hallelujah, it is written. It is written. Hallelujah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And him only shall you serve. You shall love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It is written. And I will not worship anything other than that. The, every kingdom of this earth was put in his possession if he wanted it. The reason he didn't want it is because none of the kingdoms of this earth can compare to the kingdom of God. Listen, it wasn't, it wasn't just this, un, this amazing resistance. That was there, too. It wasn't just this extraordinary willpower. Yes, there was extraordinary willpower. But the, but the real reason he didn't bow to any kingdoms of the earth is because they are all going to fall. They are all flawed.
God. They are a total facade. None of them are what they appear to be. And the only one that will stand is the kingdom of our God. And he's looking at the devil like, why would I trade the kingdom that stands forever and ever for one of these cheap little imitation kingdoms? Why? Why? In a million years would I ever trade the glory and the power and the majesty of this kingdom? I would to God that some young people would ah, get it in their heart to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Hallelujah. It's a different kind of kingdom. I will warn you, it's a different kind of kingdom. And it's the kind of kingdom that the world will try to tell you is offbeat. They'll try to tell you that it doesn't matter, that it's not what it appears to be. But it is the kingdom that stands. Every, every government has tried to persecute this kingdom out of existence. Hallelujah. It's been through the fire. But the fire couldn't burn it. It's been through the storm, but the wind couldn't turn it. Hallelujah. It is the church triumphant, and it's built by the hand of the Lord. I'm talking about the church in the book of Revelation, built on a rock, on a firm foundation. It's been through the flood. It's been through the fire. But one of these days, this church is going to move up a little higher. You can't, listen, you drive it underground, it'll just multiply. If you try to afflict it, it'll just expand. If you try to hurt it, the favor of God will come upon it. The Spirit of the Lord will endure it with power from on high. This church is unstoppable. This kingdom is ever expanding. And it doesn't matter how many fall away, the Lord will add more to the church daily, such as should be saved. You cannot stop the church. John the Baptist came preaching this kingdom. He preached, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said the ax is laid to the root of every tree. Everything that can be plucked up is going to be plucked up. Everything that the Father did not plant is going to be plucked up. Repent. Turn from your wickedness. Turn from your sinful habits. Turn from your worldly ways. Hear me tonight. It is time to repent. Turn from it all and pour yourself into the kingdom of God. John the Baptist said that the kingdom is at hand. Jesus Christ preached this kingdom. This is why he came to the earth. To set up his kingdom upon this earth. This is not a kingdom that you can just shake some preacher's hand and get into. You being a good person has nothing to do with being a part of this kingdom. Your old man has to die. And you must be born again of the water and of the spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is unlike any other kingdom that the world has ever known. Every other kingdom is, is, is lorded over by rulers and authoritarians who seek for their own self-interest. But this kingdom is built upon a principle of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. This is the kingdom that every ideology has falsely tried to emulate. They can't have peace unless they're in this kingdom. There is no joy outside of this kingdom. This is where you can find real love. This is where you can find true happiness. This is where the joy of the Lord is your strength. I want to preach it to you. Fall in love with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's just a different kind of kingdom. There's just no kingdom like it. It's, it's the kind of king. It's not meat and drink. It's not meat and drink. It's, 
It's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. And it is in that order. I said it's in that order. This world is looking for joy in all the wrong places. They're looking for peace. They will never find peace. They can sign whatever treaty they want to sign. But they will never have peace until they have righteousness. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness. That comes first. And once righteousness is established, then there is peace. And then there is joy in the Holy Ghost. And, and righteousness cannot be achieved by human means. It cannot be gathered by man's hands. He is our righteousness. He is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and redemption and sanctification. It's, it's just a different kind of kingdom the scripture says consider the lily how it toils not and it does not spin and yet Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of these little lilies in the valley Jesus said this lily if it's it's in the field today and tomorrow it's cast into the oven the grass of the field if God then so clothe the grass of the field how much more shall he clothe you he said take no thought for the morrow what you shall wear what you shall eat don't worry about tomorrow he said he said for the father knows that you have need of food and shelter and drink he said you do this you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things every listen this kingdom is so powerful that if you will seek it first everything else that you need shall be added unto you I know it's a radical message, but it's a beautiful truth. You don't have to worry about tomorrow if you will seek first the kingdom of God. Every little thing you need shall be added unto you. All the wisdom you need, all the knowledge you need, all the direction you need. Yes, all the money you need. Every little thing you need. God's, God's just going to add it onto you. That's, that's the kind of kingdom that we're talking about. It's, it's a different kind of kingdom. Here, people aren't jockeying for position. People aren't kicking other people out of the way. People aren't stepping on other people's hands as they try to climb proverbial ladders. And if you are, stop it in Jesus' name. That is not a kingdom culture. Here, God exalts and God promotes. And if we try to exalt ourselves, God will abase us. Hallelujah. But if we will humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God in this kingdom, God will exalt us in due season all you've got to do in this kingdom is humble yourself humble yourself love mercy brother Hill love mercy do justly walk humbly before thy God everything else will be taken care of hallelujah no 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 we're, we're, no in this kingdom the first is last in this kingdom the last is first they said to Jesus who is the greatest who is the greatest in the kingdom? He said, you want to know who the greatest in the kingdom is? Somebody bring me a little child. And they brought an innocent little child toddling up to Jesus. And he grabbed that little child and said, if you don't have faith like this little child, you can't even enter into my kingdom. It's a different kind of kingdom. In this kingdom... The meek inherit the earth. In this kingdom, the pure in heart shall see God. In this kingdom, the poor in spirit are rewarded. In this kingdom, the merciful obtain mercy. It's not like the other kingdoms of this world. You've got to be deprogrammed from the kingdoms of this world. The greatest cult is culture of this world. They call us a cult. They're the greatest cult that ever lived. The biggest cult is the culture of this present world. And you've got to be deprogrammed from that kind of thinking through repentance. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel an anointing of the Holy Ghost. I feel like walls are about to come down. I feel like chains are about to fall off. I feel like somebody's about to step free. Hallelujah. Out of some things that have been keeping you in bondage. God's going to deprogram you through repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. He's going to deprogram you from worldly philosophies and bring you into the everlasting glory of his kingdom. They walked into a room and there's water basins everywhere. And, and they, they don't want to, nobody wants to, nobody wants to be the first one to grab a towel and wash somebody's feet, the disciples, because that kind of shows inferiority that, that, that we would wash someone's feet, that somebody needs to be washing my feet. Not going to be the first one to grab a towel. Let's see. Let's see who the real greatest in here is. And Jesus. Jesus grabs a towel. Jesus. The great I am. The altogether lovely. The El Shaddai, the Elohim, the El Yon, Jehovah Jireh, Mechadesh, Sitkanu, Shema, Shalom, Jesus, Rofa, Rohai, Jesus, Hallelujah, the same God that thundered on Mount Sinai, the same God that shut the mouths of the lions in Daniel's lonely den, the same God, ha Hallelujah, who parted the waters of the Red Sea, God, manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, preached unto the Gentiles, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory, Jesus! He grabbed the towel, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the all in all, Jesus. How dare we not grab a towel if he's going to grab a towel? I said, how dare we? How dare we be above certain aspects of ministry? If he's going to grab a towel, my God, give me a towel. Whatever you need, Pastor, give me a towel. Let me tell you something about this kingdom. It's different than other kingdoms of this world. In this kingdom, His Majesty is servanthood. I know what we think, Pastor Maroney. We think, we think that Jesus was a servant for three and a half years and he served people for those three and a half years, showed us how to be servants and he, he led people and blessed people and loved people and he was humble and he was meek and he was lowly and then he died and then he was buried and then he resurrected from the dead and then he ascended on high and, and now he's king of all kings and he is king of all kings but his majesty is servanthood. He never stopped being a servant. Never. Come on now. Servanthood was always and is still his majesty. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He took upon himself the form of a servant because that's who he is. Yes, oh, you don't believe me? Try something. Just try something. Call on him. Call on him. Call his name. Call his name. He will come to wherever you are. He'll come riding upon the wings of the wind. He'll make the clouds his chariots. He will come to wherever you are. He will be at your beck at your beck and call. He is as close as the mention of his name. How dare we be above servanthood? We have no part in his kingdom if we are not servants. Even a son differeth nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all, servanthood never stops. Yeah, Jesus said, give me that towel. I'm going to wash your feet and everybody else's feet. Hallelujah. You have to let me wash your feet. We need to grab the towel. We need to serve. Thank God for 140 plus real McCoys. Brother Peterson, thank you for that vision. God bless you and your team for that vision. I think it's just going to keep increasing. Can I get a witness? I think it's just going to keep on increasing. I think we're going to have more and more and more who give to missions, who want to see the God. God, who want to see the rock expand, who want to see the glory of the Lord fill the earth. I think we're going to see more because we've got some kingdom people in this house. We've got some kingdom people in this house who believe. 
who want to see miracles and signs and wonders and lost souls saved. It's a different kind of kingdom. It's a kind of kingdom where the wolf lays down with the lamb. It's a kind of kingdom where children play around the hole of a snake and are not afraid. There are no predators in this kingdom. There's no danger in this kingdom. This is why God told Moses to take off his shoes. Why? Because he was standing on the ground of the kingdom. He was standing on holy ground. And he said, Moses, take off your shoes. I used to think that God was saying, Moses, if you want to come into my presence, you better get those nasty shoes off your feet. You're going to mess up my carpet. That's not what God was saying. God was saying, Moses, take your shoes off, man. You don't need them here. You need them out there. You need the guard up out there. There's rocks and there's thorns and thistles and snakes and scorpions and... There are a lot of ways to get hurt out there. There are a lot of ways to get injured out there. But you're in my territory now. You're in my kingdom now. This needs to be the safest place on earth. Take the guard off. Take the guard off your feet. Take your shoes off. Kick back. Put your feet up. You're on holy ground. You, you can dance here. You can shout here. You are free here. It's the kingdom. It's the kingdom. It's a highway to holiness. I said it's a highway to holiness. And none shall go up there but the pure in heart. No ravenous beast there. No burglar there. No murderer, rapist, or racist there. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. the king and here's the thing even though they heard it they still thought it was kind of like other kingdoms and they wanted Jesus to set up his kingdom right here right now in the physical and then something very strange happened even though he told him it would he died and when he died and was buried, they thought all hope was lost. But he rose from the dead. And he told them that my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is in you. Bishop Mitchell, his kingdom is real. It is literal. It is literal. But right now, it's inside of us. And until this mortal puts on immortality, and until this corruptible puts on incorruption, we've got the rock inside of us. We've This is what he told his disciples. He said, go tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And they did. They went to Jerusalem. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When this was noised abroad, there were devout Jews out of every nation under heaven who came. And they saw them speaking with tongues in their own languages wherein they were born and they were confused. They said, what meaneth this? What meaneth this? That we hear them speak in our own languages. They are Galileans. They can't speak our language. What meaneth this? There was another crowd who didn't speak multiple languages like the devout Jews. And they, they looked at this and thought it was just, just craziness. And they said, these men are drunk with new wine. But Peter, standing up with the 11 and the rest of the apostles, he, he stood up and said, men and brethren, 
Be it known unto you and hearken to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And you ask what meaneth this? Let me tell you. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And Peter preached Christ unto them. He preached Christ from the Old Testament. He preached Christ from the Psalms. He preached Christ from the Old Testament prophets. And while he preached, they became more and more aware that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. And then he brought it right home to their doorstep. And he said, you took him. And by wicked hands, you crucified him. And you slew him. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom you have crucified... God has made him both Lord and the anointed one. When they heard this, it, it devastated them. They knew in that moment that the long-awaited Messiah had come. The long-awaited king of this kingdom had come. That he came with healing in his wings. That he came with love in his heart. That he came with joy to distribute. And instead of receiving him, they nailed him to the cross. They crucified him. They slew him. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they didn't just say, well, men and brethren, what are we going to do? No, it was a desperate heart cry. They said, oh, men, brethren, what shall we do? They knew that the kingdom had come and the kingdom had gone. They knew that the kingdom had arrived and they nailed it to a tree. They knew that the prophecies of the Old Testament had accumulated and culminated in the life and the ministry of Jesus and they killed him. The door is shut. What shall we do? And Peter said unto them, yeah, you're right. It is shut. You, you had your chance. And the kingdom came, and you crucified the king. Yeah. And he said, the door to the kingdom closed. And I'll tell you what. He said, there was a conversation I had with Jesus one time. And he gave me some keys. Let's see if I can find those keys. Because he... He asked me a question. He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And he said, everybody had a different opinion. Some were saying Jeremiah. Some were saying John the Baptist. Some were saying Elijah or Habakkuk or Zephaniah or Zechariah or Haggai or Malachi or Micah. Just one of the prophets. But, but Peter said, I knew who he was. I raised my voice. I shouted as loud as I could. You are the anointed one, the son of the living God. God manifest in flesh. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven, he has revealed it unto you. And I'm giving to you the key. And Peter said, I, I've got those keys. And even though the door is locked, we can get in. Here's how you get in. Repent. Repent, 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 repent. Repent ye for the kingdom of 
of heaven is at hand. Repent from your sin. Repent from your evil. Repent from your wickedness. Repent from your rebellion. Repent from your worldliness. Repent. Repentance simply means turning away. Listen, you may have come down and cried and walked away unchanged. You may have come down and poured your heart out before and walked away unchanged. Here's repentance. Stop. Turn around. That's it. Turn around. I'm saying something right now to everybody who's going the wrong way. Turn around. Turn around. It's one of the keys to the kingdom. Come on, don't you want to go? Don't you want to go where the joy flows like a river? Don't you want to go where peace comes in the midst of the storm? Don't you want to go? In my Father's house are many mansions. Don't you want to go? Turn, repent, and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Let me tell you what happens when you're baptized in Jesus' name. There's an identity swap that occurs. When you're baptized in Jesus' name, there's an identity swap. You die in the water, and when you come up in Jesus' name, there's a new name on you. Let me tell you why that matters. Because there are two books at the judgment seat. One is the Joel's book of life. It has everything Joel Urshan said and did, good or bad, wrong or right. It's a terrible book. I don't want anybody to see it. It's about this high. It's got in chronological, alphabetical order all of my misdeeds, all of my issues, all my problems. That's the Joel's book of life. Then there's another book. That's the Lamb's book of life. And in that book is all of his innocence and purity and holiness and blamelessness. And if I... Hear me now. This is not semantical. These are not doctrinal details that we squabble over. The fact is, we do not want to stand before God with our name on us. I don't want to be judged by the Joel's book of life. And the beautiful thing is, if my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, I'm not judged for my misdeeds. I'm judged according to his holiness. I hope you realize none of us get to go to heaven. You do know that, right? None of us, every one of us falls short of the glory of God. Did you know that it is your righteousness that is as filthy rag? That means it's the good stuff you do that is as filthy rag. The stuff you do that people rightly applaud you for, that is as filthy rag. Your holiness is not holy enough to take you to heaven. Our only hope is to be in Jesus. That's why it matters that we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And when I stand before him, I stand there covered by the blood. Covered by his identity. And all of a sudden, it's me who's innocent. It's me who's pure. 
It's me who's holy, not by my works of righteousness, but by grace are you saved through faith. And that happens through repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you something. When you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you will speak with new tongues. You will speak in other tongues. And that tongue, as it's yielded to God, your whole body will become yielded to God through your receiving of the Holy Ghost. And that tongue that no man can tame, yielded to the Holy Ghost, your whole body comes into subjection to the praise you are giving to God in an unknown tongue. And when the Holy Ghost gets inside of you, he shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever Jesus has commanded. And when the Holy Ghost gets inside of you, he shall lead you and guide you into all truth. And when the Holy Ghost gets inside of you, he is a quickening spirit. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if he dwell in you, shall quicken your mortal body. Let me tell you what happens. You feel it right now. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you feel something right now. This is why sometimes people that get the Holy Ghost, sometimes they'll shake. Just, oh, oh, oh. They'll shake. Their, their head will move. Their, their shoulders will move. Their, there's, a, there's some quickening on the inside of them. It's quickening their mortal body. And on the day that the trumpet sounds, you know, I've got, speaking of keys to the kingdom, I've got a key fob. And if I push a little red button on that key fob, it's going to make my car go out of control. Horns honking and lights flashing. And that car will begin to react because the manufacturer put a sensor in the key fob and a sensor in the automobile and they are connected to one another. And when this sensor in the key fob activates, the sensor in the automobile react, reacts to it. That's what happens when the trumpet sounds. There's a sensor in the trumpet that is connected to the Holy Ghost that's in you. And when that last trumpet sounds, these feet just won't stay on the ground. And I'm going to tell you, if that mortal body is dead and in the grave, the Holy Ghost... Hallelujah, we'll raise it up out of the ground. These are the keys to the kingdom. These are the keys that unlock the door that we shut. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. If you're here tonight and you need the Holy Ghost, you repent of your sins. Turn from your wicked ways. You lift up your hands and begin to praise his name. And God will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm coming to a close, but I'm going to tell you how this works. I'm going to take you back to the miracle of the wedding at the Cana of Galilee. They said, we need wine. He said, fill the water pots with water. And they said, but we need wine. He said, fill the water pots with water. And they began to fill the water pots with water. And when they filled the water pot, a quarter of the way it was still water. Halfway it was still water. Three-fourths of the way it was still water. But when it reached the brim, something happened. The water was turned to wine. Your soul is the water pot. Your praise is the water. And the more you praise him, 
I praise you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I magnify you, Jesus. There's nobody like you. There's nobody like you. You alone are worthy. You alone are worthy. You're high and lifted up. You're the king of all kings. You're the Lord of all. You better get ready. I said, you better get ready because the water is about to reach the brim. And when the water reaches the brim, God is going to give you the unction of the Holy Ghost. And that water of your known praise is going to turn into the language of another tongue. Here's what I want us to do right now all across this house. My God, have mercy. The Lord is getting ready to move so mightily among us. All across this house, I want every person here whether this is your first time in an apostolic service or if you were raised in it, I want every person here to lift up your hands and begin to repent of your sins. I want you to begin to tell God, Lord, forgive me of my sins, I pray. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. Lord, help me, I pray, to turn from my wicked ways. Come on, let's repent right now. You see, I've tried this before. Of course you have. We all have. God's going to give you strength to repent tonight. Lord, I need your help. I'm trying to live holy. I don't know how to live holy. God, I turn from my wicked ways. I turn from my sinful habits. I turn away from my old man. I turn away from the things that are not pleasing to you. Come on, do it. Do it tonight. From the front to the back, from side to side, repent. The kingdom is at hand. Repent. The kingdom is at hand. It's time to depart from the evil way. It's time to depart from the carnal path. It's time to leave the old man behind. Lord, forgive me for the lusts of my flesh. Forgive me for following after the lusts of my eyes. Forgive me for the pride of life. Forgive me for the love of money. Forgive me for holding grudges against others. Forgive me for the malice and the hatred and the wrath and the strife. Forgive me for fornication and adultery. Forgive me for idolatry. Give me the strength to turn away from it, oh God. Come on, you're putting a key in the door right now. Come on, you're unlocking a door. That's going to usher you into the greatness of his glory. This is the peace you have been longing for. This is the everlasting joy upon your head. This is the pure conscience you have been desiring. Oh, we're going to stay here for just a moment. We're going to stay here for just a moment. I want you to go ahead and confess things to God right now. Go ahead and confess it. And just tell him. If you listen, you can, cup your, you can cup your hands over your mouth if you want to. But I want you to tell him, God, I'm really sorry. God, I, I'm confessing. I know this is a sin. I know this is a problem. I'm not trying to, I don't want to be rebellious anymore. I don't want to be stubborn about it. I'm turning away. I'm turning away. I want the kingdom. I want the kingdom. I want the kingdom. I don't want the kingdoms of this world. I'm tired of the death that surrounds me on a daily basis. I want life. I'm tired of being deceived. I'm tired of the thief that steals, kills, and destroys. I want abundant life. We're going to stay here for just a moment. We're going to stay here for just a moment. Come on, you're putting some things in the hands of God right now that you're never going to pick back up. I said, you're putting some things in the hands of God right now that you're never going to pick back up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Come on, go ahead. Go ahead, weep. Weep and cry. Weep and cry. 
You're safe. You're safe here. Take your shoes off. You're safe. This is holy ground. You don't have to guard yourself here. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is holy ground. This is holy ground. <laughs> now one by one, I want you to start filling that water pot with water. One by one, I want you to start filling that water pot with water. As you feel the release, I want you to begin to praise Him. I want you to begin to praise Him. Come on, I want somebody high. I want somebody in the back right now. I want you to let a praise so deep, a praise so real, to well up inside of you. Ah. Come on, fill that water pot with water. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him for his love. Praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his great grace. Praise him for his mercy. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord. Don't stop praising him. Don't stop praising him. You've only just begun. It's going to overtake you. It's going to overtake you. It's going to overtake you. going to sing. We're going to sing. But some of you are waiting for the song to start. And in this kingdom, the song is in you. Some of you are waiting for the beat of the drum, but in this kingdom, the rhythm is in you. Oh. I want somebody to dance before the music really gets going. I want somebody to shout. Let God do a miracle. 